Hello, and welcome to the last lesson of this chapter, which is 6.5, average value of a function. So this doesn't have to do with uh, our areas under our curves or our rotating about our axes anymore, but we are still using integrals. And we need to recall that when we use an integral, what we were really doing was adding up something a bunch of times. So we think way back to Riemann sums, we were looking at an infinite number of rectangles is what we were doing. So really, when we talk about an integral, we're talking about adding up a lot of terms, n terms where n approaches infinity. Okay. So if we think about the average value of something, if we had finitely many numbers, say n numbers, y1, y2, y3, all the way up to yn, in order to find the average of those numbers, we would add them all up and then divide by the number of numbers that we have. So we do y1 plus y2 all the way up to yn and divide by n, the number of numbers. So how do we find the average value of a function on an interval? Well, we would need all of our f of x values or all of our y values on that interval. We would need to add them up and then we would need to divide by the number of numbers. So if we think about that, we're going from a to b, the number of numbers would be b minus a, that would be our n. Okay. So let's actually write that down. So n would be b minus a, okay, which we see here. Okay. In order to add up all of our f of x values or all of our y values from a to b, if I wanted to add all of these y values up, we could use an integral. We could do the integral from a to b of f of x. This is the sum of all f of x's from a to b. That's what that really is. So if I wanted to find the average value, we would take the sum of all the y's or all the f of x's and divide by the number of those numbers, which would be dividing by b minus a, or 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. We can also say that there exists a number c in our interval such that the integral of f of x dx is equal to f of c times b minus a. So let's just, if we, we multiply the other side by b minus a, where f of c is our average, okay? So somewhere in here that basically it's saying there must be a c somewhere such that you have an f of c that is the same as the average, okay? All right, so let's find our average value of this one, okay? So f average is going to be 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. In this case, we're going to have 1 over 2 minus negative 1. This is our a, this is our b. We're going to integrate from negative 1 to 2. Our f of x is x squared dx, or 1 over 3 times one third x cubed evaluated from negative one to two, which would be one over three. We could also, um, again, bring this inner one over three out to make it one over nine right away if we prefer. We get two cubed over three minus negative one cubed over three, which gives us one over three times eight over three plus one over three, or one over three times nine over three, or 1 over 3 times 3, which gives us 1. Okay. So the next one is we're going to find all values x in the interval negative 1 to 2 such that f of x equals our f average. So we basically want to find uh, where the averages actually happen, at what x values do we have these f values. So we're saying f average is equal to 1, or our y is 1, that's our average y value, and we want to find out where that happens, okay? So we're saying f of x equals 1, okay? Well, we know that f of x is x squared, which means that x would be plus or minus 1, okay? These are both in this interval because it's a closed interval, so we would keep both. So basically what this is saying is if we had a graph of our function, we would actually 
equal our average value at two points when x is negative one and when x is one, which means that you must have some places where your x's are bigger than that and some places where your x's are smaller than that. Okay, let's try one more. Find the average value of this function on zero to one. So f average is going to be one over b minus a, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So we get one over one, which is just the integral from zero to one of x squared, x cubed plus one to the fourth dx. So now we must integrate this and I'm going to get you to pause and think about what we need to do to integrate this. So go ahead and pause. Come back when you're ready. Okay, so hopefully you are back now. And we have this lovely integral here, which hopefully we'll notice you need u substitution. So we're going to say let u equal x cubed plus 1, the inside stuff. du is therefore 3x squared dx. We don't have a 3x squared, we just have an x squared dx, so we're going to get 1 third du is equal to x squared dx. Then we can go ahead and rewrite our integral. So we're going to have 1 third u to the power of 4 du. Now a reminder that when we do u substitution, if you are going to integrate using the u and keep the u in your answer, then we need to adjust the bounds to match u. If you want to keep the bounds as 0 and 1, then you would need to substitute x cubed plus 1 back in for the u before you evaluate. So in other words, we're going to be doing the antiderivative next of this u regardless. Whether we evaluate at that point or sub back in depends on what we've done with our bounds. So if we actually integrate this, this is the same as one third times integral of u to the fourth du, which is going to give us one third times one fifth u to the fifth evaluated from some bounds. So if we want to evaluate now, we need new bounds. The zero and the one will not work. If we want to plug our u back in, then we can evaluate from 0 to 1. Okay, So I prefer to find my new bounds and just use the u. Uh, I find that a little bit more straightforward. Um, but it's one less, one less step I find. I find it easier to just calculate the bounds than to have to plug back in and evaluate a more complicated function. Um, but it's really personal preference. Just please remember if you are sticking with u, you must adjust your bounds. Okay. So if x is equal to zero, then u is equal to zero cubed plus one, which is one. So that's going to be my new lower bound. If x is equal to 1, u is equal to 1 cubed plus 1, which is 2. That's going to be my new upper bound. Okay. So now we can evaluate. This is going to give us 1 third times 2 to the fifth times 1 fifth minus 1 to the fifth times 1 fifth, okay. which gives us 1 third times 32 over 5 minus 1 over 5. This gives us 31 over 5 times 1 third, or 31 over 15. Okay. If we chose to sub our x back in, then we'd get 1 third times 1 over 5 times 1 cubed plus 1 to the 5, minus 1 over 5 times 0 cubed plus 1 to the 5, which gives us 1 third times 1 fifth times 2 to the 5, minus one-fifth times one to the five, which still gives us one-third times 32 over five minus one over five, which still gives us 31 over 15. So we get the same answer either way. It doesn't matter which method you choose, but you cannot use the zero and one in this method proceeding to straight to evaluation. You must have new bounds. Okay. Um, last, uh, just a couple refreshers. If f is integrable on the interval a to b, in other words, if you can find the integral on your closed interval, 
if f is an even function and you're going from negative a to a, uh, so for example, um, sine is an, uh, sorry, cosine is an even function, right? So if I want to go from negative a to a, let's say there's negative a to a, then this is the same as saying two times the integral from zero to a. So basically I'm taking this portion here and I'm just doubling it, which makes sense because it would be a reflection on the other side. Okay. And if we had an odd function, so for example, sine was an odd function. Okay. If I went from negative a to a, then the integral from negative a to a is zero. Basically, the portion from negative a to zero and zero to a cancel out with each other, okay? So those just might help you um, do some of the questions just a little bit quicker um, than sitting there calculating it all. Of course, you still can, but you'll get the same result. These are just some kind of shortcuts for you. And that's it.